Hi everyone, here is Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club, and I'm very happy to welcome everyone for our conference number 30. That is a big achievement for us, um, and uh, also very happy that we are here at the Kunstquartier Betanien. Um, I want to say hello to the audience that is here with us, despite the terrible weather of Berlin today, and also the people that are following us online, and of course to all the great speakers that join us for this conference. And uh, this is our 30th conference, as I say. Uh, the title is Artivism, the Art of Subverting Power. And as usual, I would like to start with a big thank you to my team. And I want to mention the people one by one. Uh, Elena Velianoska and Sabina Barcucci for the production. Veronica Nadz for the administration. Jonas Franchi for the press and design. Agnese Trocchi and Alice Bazzichelli for the communication, and Lori uh, uh, Cebular che, uh, for the production and the assistance of the production. And so I would like to ask everyone to do a big applause to them because it's thanks to them that we do this event. So, and uh, we start now with the topic of this conference, uh, Artivism, the art of subverting power. Um, we are comparing projects that deal with different forms of artivism and also their political impact on our society. And the question that we can have maybe today, tomorrow, and in these days is, uh, do we still need to speak about uh, artivism? And uh, what does it mean today to speak about this practice that is something that is very close to our heart at the Disruption Network Club? Uh, something that we have been working with uh, since uh, many years, I mean, this is almost the 10 years of the Disruption Lab, we are still at the ninth, so I won't say yet that because so next year we can do another celebration, uh, but uh, at the same time it's also a subject that is very close to my heart, uh, I would say since 25 years, and this also says a bit how old I am. And uh, in these days, uh, um, we will uh, also deal with uh, the political impact of the forms of art and activism. And at the same time, also how we can connect this topic with our present, because of course we know that artivism is a subject that has been analyzed as a combination of uh, art and activism since uh, the 70s, if you want, but even before. So why are we still speaking about it? And uh, uh, why we want still to deal with this topic today? And uh, how do we connect it with uh, the burning issues of our presence? Uh, for example, if we speak about uh, whistleblowing, uh, AI and machine learning, uh, surveillance, uh, the idea also of uh, trying to create a political impact, uh, uh, the discourse also of climate crisis. So these are all subjects uh, that we will deal with in these days. And uh, I still believe, at least on my side, uh, let's see also if the speakers that will come will think the same, uh, that uh, artists and art can also help uh, to reveal inner structures or systems and help uh, people uh, and also ourselves to understand better how to deal with these systems. And sometimes we deal with systems that are very complex, that are obscure, that we need to understand better, that we need to provide literacy. Um, and uh, I think it's really art uh, the tool and the means that uh, allow to bring these complex uh, subjects uh, closer to us and to the people and to have a better understanding. So in my perspective, there is still hope. Let's see also if uh, this will come up uh, during these days. Um, so again, I want to thank the audience uh, that is following us uh, online and remind them that we have a chat. And uh, this chat is uh, 
um, something available on our website, disruptionlab.org. You can access this, where is uh, the streaming. So if, uh, if the people are following us on YouTube, I tell them, please go to our website, because you can chat uh, with the speakers directly when we will have the panels uh, and our great team sitting over there. Uh, will help bring in these questions uh, to the speakers. Um, and so specifically, I want to really thank our uh, great uh, streaming uh, crew. Uh, the streaming uh, is done by Bowling Heads, and a special thanks also to Rana Adikari that has been with us for many, many years now. Um, so let's uh, go on, and uh, I want uh, also to thank the founders and the cooperation partners of the Disruption Lab. First of all, the Senate Department of Culture and Europe uh, in Berlin, the Riva and David Logan Foundation, the Open Society Foundations, and the we are part of New Perspective for Action, that is a project by Reimagine Europe, co-funded by the European Union. Uh, this event is also in cooperation with Global Voices and Cluster Duck that were with us uh, before the start of this conference. And uh, as usual, we want to thank our partner venues, the Kunstraum Kreuzberg Betanien, Akud, and Super. And our media partners, uh, Taz, uh, Ilmite, and Radio Web Magba, that is also joining us uh, in these days, doing great interviews to our speakers. So I mentioned the meetup with the cluster duck. This was a really great experience that we always like to also dedicate a bit of time in the introduction because as usual we have a community program as well that is running before and after the conferences. And uh, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we were very happy to invite uh, the Cluster Duck Collective that uh, did the workshop called Hype Compass between the deep fake simulation and core propaganda. So they were creating a political compass meme that was modified by them uh, to envision together the future of artivism, uh, uh, art and politics. And speaking about our community, I also wanted to mention that we have our great uh, Telegram channel. This is something new from the Disruption Lab. Uh, so you can all subscribe the channel, and there we are sending news about us. And not only, uh, since we only do free conferences uh, a year, we also thought we could use it to inform the public about events uh, that are close to our topics and are happening in Berlin. And now we enter into the program of these days. Uh, we start with the keynotes, uh, Inverted Gates, Watching the Watchers in the Well-Watched World. And uh, I'm very, very happy, but then I will introduce him properly, uh, to have with us uh, Lauri Love and also Manu Luc. Uh, I am the moderator of this panel, so then I will do my introduction later. Uh, but this panel will be about art activism, hacking, and counter surveillance. And so, of course, a lot about also the discourse of human rights defenders. And so after that, we have a panel that is called Fighting Technology and Systems of Domination. And here we will speak about the role of art in fighting a system of control and also bureaucracies uh, of uh, domination uh, through technology and our body. And uh, um, tomorrow, instead, we start a bit earlier at uh, free sortie. And uh, we have first uh, a video in homage of Giacomo Verde, that uh, was uh, our dear friend and activist from Italy that passed away in 2020. And so we want to celebrate him having for the first time a really wonderful performance that he did uh, translated into English. And uh, uh, this is also a direct line from an event we organized together that was called Artivism, together with many people that are also here uh, at this conference. We did it last December in Viareggio, and we were still celebrating Giacomo. So we go on with this. And so then we have the keynote of the Yes Men and Cornelia Solfrank, that I'm also very happy to welcome. And then a great panel uh, with uh, a lot of uh, wonderful collectives from still this post 
doctors to writers, so, and uh, many of these people are really great subvertisers. Uh, they really know also how to make a change, and we will speak a bit more in detail later. And uh, uh, I want to mention also the workshop of Sunday, because it's still possible to register. Uh, the first one starts at 11.30 uh, with uh, Nura uh, Tafesh, and uh, means uh, uh, very much for us also to have uh, Nura with us, because she has been also part of uh, uh, many activist uh, situations in Italy since uh, many years. And their workshop is uh, Investigative uh, Tactics for Dismantle Supremacist Cuteness. Very interesting one because uh, she's trying to reformulate what means uh, violence uh, online, especially through unconventional recruiting strategies uh, for military entertainment so that goes from uh, Israeli to US military propaganda. And uh, at the same time, this is a subject that is intertwined with uh, cute manga, fan art, and gaming. So I really tell you, <laughs> subscribe this, because it's very interesting to see also the big archive she put together. And then we have the other workshop uh, with Vitersso, uh, that is also about political art action uh, and how we could create actual change. It's called It Doesn't Work Anyway measuring the impact of political art actions, and another workshop that ran parallelly with Yasmin Boudiev, that I also welcome here, that is called Listening Structures, a co collective process for big text interrogation. And so this workshop will also connect the discourse of big tech and public sector, and trying also to understand what is the impact on minoritized communities. So, but now, before that, we have also a moment of a little, you know, promo for ourselves. Uh, we uh, try to uh, also have a membership subscription at the Disruption Lab now. Uh, so you can support us if you want, and uh, you can become a member. And it's really a bad economical deal for us, and really good for you, because with 50 euro a year, you can just come to all our events, including the workshops. So this is a great support if you want to give it to us. And at the same time, it's also nice, because you get a wonderful golden card that our our Jonas did it for you. So we try to be nice with our members. Uh, but now we arrive to the moment of our keynote in which we start our conference, Artivism. And I'm very happy to call on stage our great speakers, Manu Lux and Lauri Love. So just give you a moment to come and also me to breathe a second. <laughs> um, yes, so very, very happy to have you here. And uh, I am extremely proud uh, to say that uh, we took the challenge and uh, really the joy to invite uh, Lauri Love that uh, was not able to travel for many years and uh, because of this case that we will also mention more briefly, uh, not more in depth later, uh, but uh, you know, after a big case of extradition to the US, we managed now to have uh, a person that came to visit us at the Disruption Lab and Lauri was also with us in the past uh, online, but is a completely different situation to have him here. So I really want to say welcome from Berlin and a big applause to Lauri Law. <laughs> and then I also want to welcome Manu Luch, that uh, I got the pleasure to know since some years now, because uh, when I was uh, um, a researcher at Aarhus University, we organized an event in 2009 with my past colleague, Lars Lofgren, and uh, this uh, event uh, was called 
surveillance, the art of inverse surveillance. And I'm very happy that uh, actually this is again the topic of today. <laughs> so, I mean, after many years, we are still speaking about this, but uh, I would say the challenge uh, is also getting uh, bigger and higher. And uh, so I'm very proud, Manu, that uh, there is also this thread that connects us and our work. And also very proud that with the important work that you do, you also reach us in Berlin. So also an applause to Manu, please. <laughs> so uh, we mentioned at the beginning that uh, the title of this panel is Watching the Watchers in a Well-Watched World. And, uh, uh, Actually, this is the subtitle. The title is Inverted Gates. That uh, was uh, also suggested by Lauri, I have to say, so I stole it from him. <laughs> it was very poetic. And um, I think it fits really well with the work of both of you. And it fits really well with the work of the Disruption Lab. And uh, I just want to give a little intro to this panel by saying, uh, that uh, this panel connects really well with our previous conference that was called Smart Prisons, um, in which we were also investigating um, the connection between technology, prisons, and tracking and monitoring. And in this conference, we had with us, among many other great speakers, uh, Stella Assange. And I want to mention uh, Stella Assange because also this is a topic that is very close to us at the Disruption Lab. Uh, we know that uh, the appeal has been rejected in the case of Julian Assange. And now they have really few weeks uh, to appeal again uh, and uh, have a new court uh, trial. And uh, the situation is really bad. Uh, I think we are really at the last step now. Doesn't look absolutely good because unfortunately this story doesn't have any support from the media, any support from the politic among only few people that do it. And I think in general is a shame because also what we are doing here at the lab, what we do as many people that are here in this room, also people in this panel, uh, I would say WikiLeaks has been a big inspiration, at least to transform the idea of journalism, the idea to access of information, the role of whistleblowers. Uh, so I really want to mention that, at, at least to sensibilize about this case. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it's very difficult to say what could be done, but uh, for sure the silence is the worst thing to do. And uh, so in this panel, we will also discuss uh, uh, the idea and the development of smart technologies and especially also how they focus on the usage of pervasive uh, technologies and also how we can respond uh, through art and activism. So I want to start introducing properly Manu, that will be the first uh, speaker. She is an artist, uh, filmmaker and researcher. She is currently honorary fellow at the University of Exeter an artist researcher of Radical Matter, and senior researcher associate at the AI design of the Royal College of Art. She researched the effect of emerging technology on social relations, urban space, and political structure. And also her current focus that we will see today is on corporate governmental relationship and their hidden agenda for the algorithmic city. She has been uh, authoring really great films uh, like uh, Faceless from 2007, Dream Rewired 2015, and also Algorithm from 2019. And now there is a new film in production that is about uh, Ahmed Mansour, that is a, a blogger, poet, engineer from the United Arab Emirates that is currently in prison. And so this is also another case that we really need to know. And now I leave the word to Manu that will tell us more about all this. And a film about Ahmed Mansour is under production um, through Manu. So we are also very curious to see. And I think today we will see some little part of it. Thank you, Manu. Thank you for having me here at the 30th uh, conference, Auguri, and congratulations. I'm really delighted. Um, 
So I'd like to talk to you today about um, ongoing interest, engagement, um, yeah, about um, Emirati-UK relationships. So why, why the Emirates? Um, as uh, Tatiana mentioned, my arts practice of 20 plus <laughs> um, years is uh, yeah, very much focused on uh, the human condition in the networked age, if you like. So, um, uh, really, how uh, can we um, harness art to investigate our data environment? Um, so, especially as we see ourselves increasingly um, confronted with closed systems. So, I chose a still here from a project I was for many years uh, really working was around the topic of uh, CCTV, closed circuit television, that then converged with um, the information networks. Mm. Uh, so how, how could art um, investigate the, the data sphere? Or, but also really how, if we look at this Faustian pact, as I call it, because clearly uh, networks also provide us with um, comfort and lots of other promises, being everywhere at once, but there seems to be a price to pay. So that's the Faustian pact, our relationship to these technologies and how can um, art help to turn this relationship into a tangible experience and data doesn't smell and doesn't uh, manifest itself in that same visual way as, as maybe it was in the case of CCTV. So that was a, a good example to work with back then. Um, so when the notion of smart was introduced, uh, again, smart gadgets, smart technologies, um, um, it, it really wound me up, I have to say. <laughs> so, um, it seemed to be introduced by the tech industry as a sort of synonym for efficiency. But really, to me and many others, it just meant an even more closed gadget and system with a shiny surface. And so then what, you know, what are even then smart cities promising? So, so what, does, what does that mean? What are smart city technologies? Smart city, that was really the brainchild again of the industry more than 10 years ago, trying to upscale this uh, promise of um, networked um, predictive analytics applied as a sort of city operating system. Yeah, so I, I um, attended a smart city conference in order to see who are these um, makers of the new city. Like, to me, it felt again like a highly um, undemocratic way of reforming or reinventing or remodeling or introducing this paradigm shift of what the urban space um, uh, holds for us. And, um, yeah, and um, it was evident that really at this, all these smart city uh, business events, um, it was the Emirates, it was Abu Dhabi and Dubai uh, that were the showcases, like the darling kids. So, yeah, having a closer look then at the Emirates, um, I could really see they have a love for superlatives. I mean, you know, it's quite um, astonishing. Uh, it's a very young nation and um, already uh, we see the highest tower there and in competition with themselves they're building the next highest tower that is higher than their highest tower and you have an indoor skiing slope um, by 45 degrees outdoors and you can go to a lecture at uh, New York University in the morning and to the Louvre in the afternoon because they have that too and, and so on and so on. Um, so, um, yeah, prominent speakers at, at these events would, um, would uh, be uh, the director of uh, Smart Dubai, who had even a high ambition to, to turn Dubai into the happiest city in the world through smart technologies. So how um, would such a contentment be implemented? I'm going to play a clip. Um, from an interview with Dr. Aisha bin, uh, bin, 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 Buti bin Bishra, um, the uh, director of Smart Dubai since many years. Mm. Oh, okay.
waiting for too long. Um, okay, I'm just going to load it again. Okay, please. No idea. Yes, when you go to every sector in Dubai, it is smart. Alhamdulillah, today we have uh, the long, smartest, uh, longest driverless metro. Yeah. Uh, our metro station, they are very smart. The tram stations also are very, very smart. Our taxis become very smart. Our buses, with the project with Cisco, yeah. uh, having sensors all over the buses and the, and the shelters, bus, bus shelters, become smart. When we talk about environment, we have smart grids, smart meters at homes. So, okay, then how, wh what else you want in Dubai to be more smarter? One of the best things data can tell us is how happy you are. Because ultimately, the job of a city is to make sure its citizens, residents, and visitors are happy. So we set up the happiness meter to tell us just that in real time. It helps us improve your happiness when you share what's going right or what we can do better. Uh, so each uh, city manager has his own dashboard. It's something like a heat map yeah. to know like if things are like green, green or, or red, red, yes. Uh, and if, if there is like a, a, a unhappy experience, they can drill down and get more detail why people are unhappy about this experience. It's just another way that data is making things better for all of us. So don't forget to share your feedback with us next time you see the happiness meter. Smart Dubai, inspiring new realities. Uh, this is, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so it, I was really desperate to get a user's perspective and reached out, tried to find an Emirati, Denison, um, and was then eventually introduced to Ahmed Mansour, who was willing to speak to me on a recorded interview, recorded conversation, but however he was far the ordinary um, inhabitant of the UAE, but we speak about this um, later. So as a tele-engineer, very competent to uh, comment on um, yeah, the introduction of what smart Dubai holds. So I hope Um, hmm. Okay, yeah, please, if you could. The impact of a smart city kind of arrangement in a democratic country is different than it is impacts in a non-democratic country. We would suffer a lot more that kind of thing. Now, Probably an, an individual would care about, uh, you know, uh, his privacy, like, you know, anywhere else in the world as well. We would care as well about our, our privacy, but beyond that one, you know, uh, you know, especially if you are involved in, in, in activities like, you know, political activities or in human rights activities, you will have to be extremely uh, cautious about what you carry with you. Your uh, smartphone is not a smartphone anymore, it's a tracking device, basically. You know, even, even your regular telephones are tracking devices by nature because they communicate with the towers, right? And they, the authorities know to great proximity where you are by using, a tech, you know, the technology by itself. They basically measure the signal to noise, to noise ratio from the tower and they, they can tell to great extent your your location within meters, right? Even this is this is even before the smartphones. Now with that with the smartphones there were like, you know, several hundreds of applications that can track you. The in, in fact uh, one amazing thing that uh, you know uh, that 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 shows the uh, the trend that UAE uh, that showed the trend that UAE were going in 2009, the telecom operator pushed a spyware over the air to all the BlackBerry devices. 
And, and it was a real big scandal because it has been discovered immediately by uh, software experts as well as acknowledged by the BlackBerry company. You know, they, they wanted really to have a full control. They want to, you know, to have everything under their view after they failed of you know pushing the spyware over the over the air people did not run it and did not execute it and they they decided to to stop the blackberry services because they didn't want to give them the uh, the encryption but what actually did blackberry agree to do to maintain service in the uae all the government would say when they made the announcement today is that Research in Motion, which makes BlackBerry, is now in compliance with their regulatory framework. Um, we could not get more information than that. However, a source of ours that's familiar with these talks tells us that this deal will allow the Emirati government to secure BlackBerry information through a hardware solution. So if we think about what the hardware is, we're talking about servers. Now, at the moment, all of uh, Research in Motion's servers are outside the UAE and that information is encrypted. It's coded, so only uh, Research in Motion can give you that key to encryption. Uh, so if a server was indeed here in the UAE, it would allow the Emirati government to go through still a, a court process, show some evidence that they believe uh, certain communications um, are leading to crimes, and then possibly get access to that encrypted information. Yeah, so Ahmed uh, could not be fooled. Even before Arab Spring in 2009, when the BlackBerry crisis was all over the international media, um, he uh, commented on the situation in a way, you know, cutting through <laughs> men, saying, okay, youth that developed more political interest and engagement and want to organize over BlackBerry, which was, which was really the most secure communication device back then, um, yeah, uh, started to be seen as a danger to the Emirati ruling families. And um, so even back then, uh, kind of, yeah, com uh, commentating on, on, on these um, situations and it became increasingly uh, disillusioned about the idea of progress um, as uh, pursued by the Emirati leadership. So, um, yeah, so maybe a few more words. Who is Ahmed Mansour? He mm, went to the States to study uh, telecommunication and was really enthusiastic to return to the, his country and to contribute to the development of this very young nation, actually same age, independence and Ahmed, um, and started to work for a satellite company in Dubai when um, the BlackBerry crisis happened. And then a year later, during Arab Spring, Ahmed um, facilitated together with a few others an online communication forum, something and you know completely unheard of back then, and people were like really craving to discuss anything from music to religion, but also how the country should be run and um, uh, questioning um, if um, uh, suffragette, like a, a voted parliament, um, uh, should be introduced stage by stage as promised by the founding father, al Nahya. So uh, Ahmed also signed a petition back then uh, demanding exactly this, and this led to his arrest and the arrest of many others. But Arab Spring, a lot of international attention, and through this international pressure, uh, he and a few others were released. However, he never got his passport back and never got his um, something comparable to a, a, a license that allows him to work back. So, but also he was like really... Um, now upset about um, this experience, the arrest, the treatment in prison, the unfair show trial, and um, took up uh, human rights work, really in investigating the, uh, the, the force disappeared in the Emirates, so the, the political prisoners, so to say, um, that there are, so unfortunately that's another superlative um, on, on the flags of the UAE, the highest uh, percentage, according to the, the Emirati population, which is one million of uh, political prisoners. And he would internationally um, raise his concerns about the situation. 
passing on information to NGOs, um, blogging, tweeting. So in 2015, he was awarded with a um, um, prize that is compared to the Nobel, no, Nobel Prize of Human Rights, uh, the Martin Annals Award in Geneva. And um, okay, so back to our encounter, I returned to London. Um, when he was again all over the media because uh, he had been targeted by spyware and was alert and um, knowing enough to pass it on to Citizen Lab and they could identify it to be a Pegasus attack and could also identify the likely operator to be the UAE state. Mm. So um, shortly after this really mm, we learned about his arrest, it was just a short notice um, on the Emirati state-run news agency website. Um, uh, he was arrested and um, uh, picked up at, at night and um, yeah, so detained on the orders uh, of the public prosecution for cyber crimes, yeah, accused of promoting false and shaded information for the internet and serving agendas aimed at spreading hatred and sectarianism on social media. So, well, that um, hit me, of course, as a shock, you know, somebody you sat in a room with, had dinner with, um, had a good understanding with, um, but I didn't want to really fall f immediately for this notion that every um, authoritarian country, I don't know, that everything is automatically bad and wrong. So, so my colleague, uh, Jack Wolf, who was also at the Dubai shoot with me, um, and I, we went to Ahmed's um, Twitter page and we scraped um, all the tweets that we could. Um, 3,159, it was for some reason, and auto-translated them into English. So really his tweets just showed his deep concern for um, uh, this side of, um, yes, yeah, like the advancement of human rights in the country going hand, that should go hand in hand with um, um, technological advancement. Laurie, could you hold this for a second? Um, so at the, at the entrance, you can pick up um, this brochure for free. Mm, it will uh, give you some information and then you can wider, then you can, oops, unfold it again. And then on, on this page, you will find the transcript of the interview that we filmed. Probably the, yeah, this is the last interview with him. And if you open it again, you have a poster. There are two versions. One is the Arab one, and the other one is the auto-translated one. So we wanted to distribute these uh, posters so everyone can see for themselves, you can see for themselves. Should somebody be sentenced for 10 years for these kind of tweets that just show compassion and, um, yeah, so, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, we also produced stickers and stencils and, of course, with the idea that these images would then go back onto social media and be amplified there. However, having said that, um, I, yeah, I don't know if any of you um, is uh, keeping up with the research of uh, Mark Owen Jones. He was one of my more recent interviewees for this documentary, which I at some stage decided to focus on Ahmed Mansour rather than the makers <laughs> of um, the cities um, that um, um, I, I started um, out with. Mm. So Mark Owen Jones, a professor based in Doha, is focusing on uh, the use of deception and misinformation as a tool of foreign policy, one can really say, um, in the Middle East, um, is um, researching uh, uh, and documenting the um, activity of troll farms and um, yeah, so of course um, troll farms are there to multiply voices, but you know, at, at least our efforts are authentic. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so Ahmed was sentenced to 10 years and um, nobody could attend the trial. No one is allowed to visit him in prison. We hear that he's an, kept in a um, uh, solitary confinement. Mm, and yeah, at some, at some stage I learned about a European uh, who had been imprisoned in Abu Dhabi and had been freed with the help of his government. So, and I heard that he had seen Ahmed in prison. So I reached out to him and after his recovery from the, the trauma and the, the physical trauma as well that he had undergone in prison, we met um, Arthur Ligesker, who happened to be the cell neighbor of Ahmed in this isolation tract and could talk about what daily life looks like, sleeping on the floor, eating the food from the floor, not being allowed to wash yourself, not being allowed to talk to anyone or to see anyone, not even light, not even go for a walk. Um, yeah, it's just... Um, beyond comprehension, uh, this kind of condition. And um, actually, Sing and Cry, Cry and Sing is a, is a film about Arthur Ligesca's story. It just became a film in itself. <laughs> Even so, when I met him, I was interested in his account of Ahmed's situation. Mm. Well, having heard about this, um, Con these conditions that are um, highly, you know, uh, uh, respected and award-winning human right defender is kept in. The question offers itself, why are British politicians not speaking up? You know, there are clearly so many links between Britain and the UAE. So, um, when in uh, 2018, uh, the MP... Um, uh, Alistair Carmichael, yeah, he's a, a Scottish MP, he chaired a parliamentary seminar um, in, in, in Westminster to explore this UK-UAE uh, trading relationship. And I was called as a witness and yielded this opportunity to pass on, to give words to Ahmed Mansour, who um, uh, was meant to... Uh, be silenced, right? Um, so I'm being shown that I have only two minutes left, so I'm not sure which ones to skip now. <laughs> um, so Ahmed is talking about the various forms of surveillance and um, uh, uh, new, yeah, uh, um, hacking that he, that he has been victim of, different forms of state surveillance. Mm, so, yeah, so really after this parliamentary session that also looked at the sales of the British company uh, BAE um, uh, to, the, to the United Arab Emirates, mm, the question offered itself, you know, are there not any regulations for the sale of spywares produced in democratic countries and then sold to autocratic countries? So, mm, and um, I then met with an investigative journalist in Copenhagen, Lassis Ku Andersen, uh, who was also exactly uh, looking into this question. He was interested in the kind of business that ETI, a sister company of BAE uh, based in Denmark, um, was doing. And he said, well, there's the Vazena agreement in the EU, EU so, uh, so you need to actually apply for a license. And if there's an obligation to apply for a license, there's a paper trail, and hence he started writing freedom of information requests for months and months and months. And I'm going to play this clip, if not, yeah, okay, this must have, yeah. One of the first documents <laughs> that I received was really interesting. Um, and uh, it was an export license, basically giving a company, in this case BAE Systems, um, a license to export an internet surveillance kit to 
And that was what we didn't know to what country, because they had used, the authorities had redacted that piece of information with a big black marker. Sad. So you can see here that it's, uh, it says here, end use of the product. IP monitoring and data analysis system to be used for national security and serious crime investigation. Right here. Um, but then there are a lot of things that they don't want uh, that they don't want us to know. Um, so I went home that night, and uh, my girlfriend. Is, so I showed it. Uh, we opened it up on her computer, and apparently her screen was a bit brighter than mine. Uh, so I was like going on about how this is too bad and so on, and she said, "Well, you know, you can see through the ink." And I was like, "What?" If you turn up the screen brightness completely, you can actually see here, for instance, here it says end user, like who's the customer. And it says Ministry of Interior in the state or in state of UAE, Abu Dhabi. And there's a post box address, PO box 2716. And there's even a name of some official there, Mohammed something. So uh, we also managed to get uh, a, an email threat uh, of correspondence between the Danish officials who were processing BAE Systems applications for export license here in Denmark and their British counterparts or colleagues. Um, and they have basically blacked out everything except for the regards and thank you for bearing with us while we considered this matter. Uh, there's no sort of no details about what this is about. But um, they kind of fucked up, so they sent the wrong version of the document. So you can just do this and remove the black boxes. And you can see everything. The United Kingdom had denied a kind of similar export of surveillance equipment to the UAE Ministry of Interior. And so the Danes decided they should ask them, like, why is that and what's your opinion on this application that we receive? So this is the key part um, so they say okay so this is not exactly the same product that we were considering but however we would like to make it clear that we would refuse a license to export this script analysis software from the UK because of Criteria 5 concerns and then you can look up what Criteria 5 means and that's the national security of the UK and its allies. I guess the logic was that, well, the Emiratis could be using this to spy on our people or British businesses in the UAE. Um, and then, which was quite interesting or puzzling, was that uh, the Danes replied, well, thank you for the information, we've decided to give the license anyway. Yeah, so this is exactly what happened. Um, uh, it was... Uh, However, during the yeah, Pegasus revelations that um, it turned out that 10 Downing Street, Acker, Boris Johnson had actually been infected as well <laughs> um, by, uh, yeah, initiated by the, by the UAE. Um, I'm quite um, happy now to hop over my soft power uh, chapter because I hope that you will all come and see the 90-minute documentary at the end of the year. <laughs> um, but I would like to, to play the last clip, um, which will bridge my talk with yours, possibly. <laughs> so forms of surveillance um, have moved on to what I will show now, which is going to be like a collage of media coverage, basically. Uh, be aware, these are all rough cut sequences. Um, but also, of course, the um, disinformation campaigns and these, these kind of reputation management measure, measures. Um, so it was very interesting. Only a couple of years ago, um, this new, so this new app, like a video chat app, Totalk, appeared. And you should know that in the Emirates, video chat apps um, that we commonly use are forbidden. So when this one was permitted, of course, everyone jumped on it. And given that 90% of the population are expats, foreign workers, um, of course, there was a big need for a video chatting app. Uh, 
Okay, there we go. Uh, maybe if you could to please. TikTok وليس تيك توك التطبيق الشهير تو توك هو تطبيق اتصالات مجاني قال صحيفة نيويورك تايمز الأمريكية إن الإمارات استخدمته للتجسس على المشتركين فيه التفاصيل في الفيديو التالي من ثم نفتح نقاش تو توك في عالم التقنية تطبيق اتصالات مجاني شأنه شأن واتساب وسكايب وغيرهما كثير في عالم السياسة الإماراتية وسيلة التجسس تفتح أمام الأمن الإماراتي أبواب البيوت وتحركات الناس وعلاقاتهم بكل تفاصيلها So every app that you download especially apps that let you communicate whether you're chatting or doing a video chat uh, all of these apps ask for permissions and if you're anything like me you just kind of blindly say okay no problem and you say, you give these apps permission well this app was looking at your location data why because it wanted to serve you the weather it asked for your contacts because it wanted to make uh, communication easier and on and on this sounds like a regular chat application the problem is that it was slurping up all of this data and sending it back to the UAE government when the app is kind of designed to allow you to give permissions, uh, it, it kind of skips that step of hacking, right? So this allowed uh, the UAE government to have access to all of the information that you might give to an application, but thinking that maybe it's private or that it's kept only between you and the app maker or you and your device maker, right? Thank you, Manu. Uh, let's applaud. So then uh, we will have, uh, after Lauri, a moment of question and answer with Manu, so you can start thinking about. Uh, really, thank you for this important work and also very important you are doing this film. Uh, so we will be very happy to to see it and uh, to watch it. And uh, let's see also if we can bring you back with the film. <laughs> uh, so, but then let's now pass to Lauri Love that also I wanted to introduce properly. Um, he's a computer scientist and also a British activist. Uh, as I mentioned before, he went through a very difficult case of extradition by the United States. Uh, in 2018, uh, he, was, uh, he successfully fended off uh, the prospect of 100 years in the US prison system for uh, his alleged activities with the hacker collective Anonymous. And uh, he also played a prominent role in the Student Occupy movement in Glasgow during uh, 2011 and 12. And uh, uh, we are also very happy, as I say, to have him here today because it's very important for the Disruption Lab and for everyone here, I suppose, and the people that are listening. Uh, he will focus on the agency that Art and Activing can create fighting the erosion of unwatched space. So we discuss also together about this discourse of surveillance, uh, the inverse surveillance that you can also bring as an art, uh, artist and activist. So we will uh, now hear from Lauri several examples about that, and I pass the word to you. Thank you. Hello. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I'm very happy to, to be here. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction. I um, will start off by saying that I'm one of the strange ones. I'm on, on the spectrum, as we say these days, neurodiverse. I um, have never, never encountered an expectation that I have not been uh, incapable of meeting and uh, had challenges uh, uh, subverting or inverting or um, being myself regardless. And so um, with that in mind, I'm going to talk about some things that will diverge a little bit from the original ideas that, that I had. Um, but I wanted to play with it. I wanted to, I took it as a provocation, as a challenge to, to not have the, uh, the entirety of what I could contribute be framed by the duality of the, the power that is looking down and the, the less powerful that are looking up because that, that kind of duality is a kind of uh, zero sum, sum game and I wanted, to, um, I wanted to leave on some more op optimistic notes. So, so I'll talk about some surveillance, I'll talk about the powers of um, leaks, but I, I'll, I'll also 
show some fun things um, that, that explore the ways that we can uh, embrace technology and not see it as necessarily something that is uh, going to restrict our freedoms, uh, but something that we can use in creative ways to uh, to have forms of identity that are collective that come from our ability to see, observe, and um, and respond to one another. So, um, assuming any of this works, and I hope that it does, um, I was going to start with um, something on the poetics, <laughs> something on the poetics of um, the gays, and so. Do I have VLC? Yeah. So I need this. Um, so I wanted to begin with a contribution from Dante. Um, do we have volume? You're missing the sound. So yeah. Maybe somebody can help. On the mixer, no? Okay, I'll just read it. I, my, my Italian isn't great, but se io credesse che mi riposa fosse a persona che mi tornasse. Okay, yeah. I'm Italian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> should, we, should we start again then? You can read it for me. I don't see, but I, yeah. sorry, I have to stand. Okay. Okay. So, se io credesse che mia risposta fosse a persona che mai tornasse al mondo, questa fiamma... Sta staria, ser... Oh, no, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> staria... Uh, okay. Yeah. Exitera. Staria senza yeah. più scosse. Staria senza yeah. più scosse. Mm -hmm. And it continues... But people don't understand what we're no, saying. No, but I'm going to translate okay. it. Ma per ciò che già mai di questo fondo non torno vivo alcun, si odo il vero senza tema di infamia, ti rispondo. So here Dante meets in, in the Inferno uh, this character, Guido uh, da, da, da Monte. Uh, I remember the name, but um, he's, he's a, he was a politician and his, uh, he, was, he was confined to the hell. But the, the meaning of the excerpt as it was used in the introduction to T.S. Eliot's poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, is um, he, he says, if I believed that from this abyss anybody could return alive, uh, this flame would stay still without flickering, which means I would remain concealed by the flame and not, not give you my story. Um, but because, if I hear correctly, nobody returns from this abyss alive, I, um, I can speak to you without fear of infamy. And the reason I wanted to, to use that is because it speaks to the notion of the gaze and the fact that the, the way uh, our capture is used by another uh, takes away the agency of our story. Whereas when Dante is with Guido in the Inferno, they can speak together without uh, Guido feeling that Dante will go away and put his own spin on it, and this is this is the the uh, theme is then taken up um, by um, the theme is taken up by um, T. S. Eliot in Prufrock, um, where he says in the poem. It's a long one, I'd love to read it in full, but we, we don't have time. But he says, there will be time, there will be time. Time's, time to make a face to meet the faces that we meet. He says, uh, he is locked in paralysis by this gaze, by this indecision, because he, um, he's, he's not sure how he will be interpreted by others. Something that I feel strongly as someone on the spectrum, because um, masking is... It's this whole phenomena in psychology. It's something that we're continuously having to do to try and be the normal that is uh, undefinable but uh, unassailable. And so um, he, he then says, I've known the eyes already. I've known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I'm formulated sprawling on a pin, when I'm pinned and wriggling on the wall, 
then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways, and how should I presume? And it's that question of, of when you have become an item in a collector's book, like a Victorian uh, uh, entom entomologist would collect these butterflies and moths and pin, pin them on the wall, then the life and the agency is, has gone out from them. Um, and so we live in an age where we have a lot of surveillance. Um, that it has become ubiquitous. The, there are many ways that people can respond to it. They can uh, ask nicely um, for there not to be such... It's be so good if... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, listen to your hearts, not, not private phone calls, they said to the spies. Um, this, this is, I, fi I find great. Um, I don't think that it was necessarily effective, but it is important that people go out on the streets um, and uh, stand, stand up for the right not to have ubiquitous surveillance. But there are other ways of engaging uh, with surveillance. So one thing that I really enjoyed with these guys called the surveillance camera players. Um, what they would do is take the opportunity of a camera and say that the camera presupposes a stage and the stage allows the theater and they would go out and they would act out um, plays for the surveillance footage and then they would use their uh, access rights under data protection to access that footage and to, to, uh, to then um, reclaim it as an art, to, to reappropriate it as, um, from surveillance to art. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, psychogeography. Um, this was a, something that was pioneered by the situationalists. Um, and the definition of psychogeography, if we can read it here, is to study the precise laws and the specific effects of the geographical environment on the emotions and the behaviors of individuals, um, which is central to the emancipation of the human psyche. And someone who, who did this in a really interesting way, I want to use as a positive example of um, collecting data and using it to map out something interesting. This was an emotion map of, um, I believe this is, um, there's, there's one from Paris and there's one from another city, but it, it measured the arousal levels of, of, of this person with the GPS data as they were going around the city. And so it was a, a way of adding, uh, adding something to the world through this data collection rather than restricting uh, possibilities. Um, so it was mentioned, the idea of surveillance. Um, surveillance, uh, like most things, is best explained by a six-year-old child. Um, so here is, um, I think, uh, Stephanie, age six. Uh, so I have surveillance is what that camera there is doing, uh, holding those people in place. And surveillance is what these happy people are doing together, looking up at power and um, uh, inverting, inverting that gaze and performing the necessary uh, social goals of accountability and oversight. And another thing that can be done, uh, another good response to um, surveillance was when this uh, Wai Hopai um, NSA base, effectively, or Five Eyes base, was being built in um, New Zealand. They like to keep it out of the way, and somebody put up these billboards, um, kind of critiquing it and saying uh, it's it's the the dirty work uh, of the state. Um, now, another another thing that has been done was this gentleman called Steve Mann. Um, turned on its head this notion that intellectual property is um, sadly in this day and age afforded more rights and protections than um, human beings. And so while there are these anti-piracy things where you can uh, go to prison for uh, uh, copying software or sharing software, he came up with this idea of say no to likeness piracy, that you don't owe me, uh, own me and you can't use me. Um, whether this was legally as effective or not, but it was certainly a, a provocation. 
Uh, I tried a similar tactic when I was having to engage in a lot of communications with um, the National Crime Agency and uh, various other legal authorities where I added a boilerplate to my emails uh, saying that they could only be used um, with permission uh, to create derivative works. And then, of course, they weren't, and I, I reserved the right to, to, to make that same objection that, that IP rights holders would have. Um, so finally, I... I'm just going to show a few a few videos of um, other creative ways where um, spaces have been carved out with the power of technology to allow people to interact in um, ways that unleash um, creativity. So I uh, will get it working. Sorry. Yeah. If I if I was better at doing things like making presentation slides, uh, this would all be a lot smoother. But you know, it, it is what it is. So. Yeah, okay, this is this is what we want. Um. So I got to know that your VLC was muted. Uh, yeah, yes. I mean, this, this, <laughs> this one doesn't really have any, any, I would like it to be bigger, but I don't okay, think we good. can do much about that. But um, this was a, an experiment conducted by the, the site Reddit. Um, Reddit, by the way, was co-founded by Aaron Swartz, whose tragic death is kind of the reason why I became notorious. Um, accidentally, but they created this thing where anyone could change a pixel uh, uh, one at a time, and it, it required people to work together collaboratively. Um, and through uh, through this collaborative process, you had the emergence of this organic artwork. So this is a time lapse of the entire time that it was running. You had people creating um, uh, different flags. Um, there was constant attempts to overwrite one another, and you would imagine that it would just descend into anarchy, but somehow something beautiful uh, emerged out of it that, that could, uh, would never have been imaginable before. Um, and it was only because uh, this technology was harnessed in, in a way that where, where people could see one another, where people could act upon one another's uh, changes, um, then the entire system um, developed this kind of self-awareness and this collective identity emerged. Um, so I, I guess I could leave it on that note or I could just play one more fun thing that... Um, back from my days of, of, of infamy and... Um, Maybe it's in another folder. Yeah, it's in the fun stuff. Okay. Um, so yeah, so uh, the reason the reason I became accidentally infamous was um, uh, this gentleman Aaron Swartz, who was an internet pioneer, um, who wanted information to be free, was was working with the likes of WikiLeaks, helped create the software that's now called SecureDrop that allows people to um, safely act as sources to encrypt data and to um, upload it to journalistic entities um, while having some kind of source protection, whistleblower protection. He was hounded to death um, by the vindictive um, elements of the US government and the oppressive... Um, uh, coercive plea bargaining system and so as a result of that the, the, there were many people who were upset. Um, one of the ways in which this upset manifested uh, was this anonymous campaign and uh, so there were a few, uh, I, the way I put it is the United States government volunteered itself for a free security audit. Um, normally they pay lots of money for the, their security to be tested. Um, this time they'd, they'd done something so horrific um, that they got it tested for free. And so this is the website of the United States Sentencing Commission, where for a brief while, uh, by entering the Konami cheat code, if you ever played um, Nintendo, you could turn it into this 1980s video game, Asteroids, and you could have the pleasure of destroying, <laughs> destroying those uh, sentencing guidelines that led to the death of Aaron Swartz and progressively reveal um, this testament. And it, it was in this era that there was a demand to be made for justice for a reform of that system. Sadly, uh, it hasn't been reformed yet, and I was invited to spend 99 years experiencing just how horrific it was. Um, we were able to resist that, and in that process, we redirected the analysis from um, 
uh, whether the United States government should control the internet unilaterally to how horrific the prison system is there. And my, my hopes was that those five years of trauma would um, set a precedent whereby my friend Julian Assange would not be extradited, but uh, that's a fight that we still have. So uh, I hope Thank that we'll you. continue to support him. Thank you, Lauri. I see also the reaction of the audience says a lot. Uh, we can then uh, go on together later with uh, some question and answer. Uh, I just have a couple of questions now for Manu. Also, I wanted to give uh, space to the audience as well. But uh, I wanted to ask Manu uh, in relation to your meeting with Ahmed Mansour. Uh, since at the beginning, also as you say, you wanted to do a research on the smart cities, uh, but then uh, when you met him and understood all the situation, you decided to also focus on this work as a human rights advocate. And uh, how, this encounter, how did this encounter influence your research on the algorithmic city? And what can you say that uh, Ahmed Mansour uh, taught you and what did you learn from him? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So when I set out to uh, document the makers of tomorrow, those who create these cities, just checking, are they cynical, are they just profit-oriented, or do they really believe in um, the ideas that they, they promote? I had some, you know, sort of critical attitude, <laughs> but I was not sure what I would find. So... I just went to Dubai because I had this invitation by uh, the CEO of the um, Connected Communities, which is Smart City, basically Department of Cisco's, um, to follow him and his team for a few days. And so it, it was a research shoot to see what, you know, yeah, because it's, that's the thing, it's such a close, you know, all the deals are being made behind closed doors. Um, um, yeah, then much of the code is, of course, black boxed and not accessible. Um, so, really, it was um, the arrest of Ahmed that um, led to this decision to really focus on the interview that um, we captured back then. And um, to also better understand why in such a powerful, wealthy country with a lot of loyalty for the ruling family, um, which also Ahmed Mansour did not um, uh, challenge in that way, um, why would it be necessary to so harshly silence one man's voice? Um, looking at this interview very carefully, um, and following this why question and a further why and why and why, <laughs> um, I just became more and more shocked about the role that the UK is playing. And really this was the key moment when I, when I felt, yeah, I want to actually make a film, not just campaign, um, because I would like to share this discovery or concern with people in the UK or in the global north, or call it as you like, um, uh, the business partners, basically, of uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia, if you like, mm, um, to understand why it concerns us all. It's not just like a human rights defender somewhere far away happened, you know, to be imprisoned. No, it really concerns us all. It's creeping up into our lives in so many different ways. Um, so, yeah, that was the turning point. And so when is the film going to be ready? <laughs> You're really <laughs> wanting to... <laughs> um, end of the year, maybe new year. Yeah. Okay, so people are going to mm. wait for it. But not so much, I would say. 
Um, then I have a question for Lauri. And uh, I also think that then I want to pass, I have many other questions, but I also want to pass it to the audience uh, because I think uh, it's important to hear also what you want to ask them. Um, since, uh, I mean, despite the whole difficult situation, legal situation you went through, what really strikes me a lot of you is that you have always so much passion and hope, and you really still believe in the idea of artivism and the power of uh, art as a form of action. So this is something that I really love of the way you work and uh, you also create a form of resistance. And uh, I wanted to mention that uh, here there is a great uh, artwork that you brought together with uh, Michelle Tilitsky that is called Dads. And uh, then after the panel, we are inviting also the audience to experiment it with you and Michelle. There is also an artwork by Cornelia Solfrank and the network of people from Hamburg that I will tell a bit more at the end of the panel. Uh, but I wanted to ask you if you could explain a bit more what is Dazzle that is over there, as we can see, how does it work, and uh, tell us a bit. Uh, yeah, so D Dazzle was um, an idea that uh, um, Michelle Shell had and asked me to um, work with her on the, the technical side, and it's, um, it's a way of sort of show showcasing how the technology works that enables facial detection, um, and uh, showing that the ways in which it could be defeated or uh, giving kind of a, an ability to, to play with it and know what kind of modifications could be made to the face to, um, to pre prevent the successful recognition. Um, and yeah, just to, to kind of um, e expose a little bit the technology because it's, it's um, developing rather rapidly and we, we wanted to um, I mean, the concern, the concern is that the um, hyper-personalized hyper uh, advertising, um, we, we, we exist in a, in a model of uh, the, the Faust, you, you mentioned the Faustian pact that we have with technology, and one, one of the Faustian uh, ways that expresses itself, that Faustianness, is that we are offered shiny things. We are offered functionality, uh, the ability to network with one another, the ability to interact with one another. But the cost of that at the moment is that we give up without any meaningful negotiation, uh, any collective bargaining rights to the data that defines us as a person. And the use of that data, once it has been appropriated by the um, by the Babylon, by the machine of capital, uh, is to to try and sell us things, is to try and control us, to try and um, fit us into categories, uh, whether it be for um, political influence, whether it be for the suppression of potential uh, civil unrest or dissent. And we're, we're in a process now where we, I feel that the great war for freedom on the internet is yet to be fought. Um, but it will will be fought in the same way that the uh, the, the labour movement eventually uh, showed people that they could collectively bargain for for the rights to the fruits to their labours. Um, that we will eventually move past the colonialist um, extractionist model of personal data on the internet to to um, a time when we can say no. Well, this the, this this contract that we enter into, this agreement to use some product or service. Um, should be one that empowers us and increases our agency rather than um, is used to exert more control over us. So uh, it's hopefully to, to continue to inspire people to remember that that's always possible. It's a, a, uh, activism, as far as I'm concerned, is any action that diverges from the acceptance of a state of affairs as given. And art, uh, by its very nature, uh, is the laying down of a challenge, the laying down of a challenge to look at something in a way that is, uh, that is a creative engagement. And so as long as there is this creative need in people, um, then there will be an invitation and the, um, the inspiration and the facilitation of engaging with the state of affairs in a way that allows us to imagine it being different and hopefully better. Thank you, and just to be very... Okay.
And to be a bit concrete, how does it work? Because it's about anti-surveillance makeup and works on the computer vision duds. So what do the people need to do? So, I mean, you can sit, sit down there. Um, the, the interface could be a bit more intuitive, but the idea is it's, we, we, we imagine it like it's a kind of beauty salon treatment. Um, you can sit down, your face faces live captured. You can play with a choice of different overlays, change the colors, change the scale, and then by pressing the capture button, you can uh, see uh, what percentage of these facial detection libraries have been successfully dazzled, successfully frustrated. And so there are seven different libraries. If you get it right, you get 100%. You just defeat all seven of them. And by just by playing with it, you can see just how much uh, of these landmarks, these features, uh, what is the necessary amount of contrast, um, what uh, different shapes, what abstract patterns can be put on that are that are uh, that diverge from this um, this organic kind of uh, relative placements of, of uh, uh, features on the face. So, does that Thank help? you. Yes, <laughs> explanatory enough. Uh, now I will pass it to the audience, and uh, if uh, somebody has a question, just raise up your hand. Also, I want to remind the people that are online, you can also ask questions to Manu and Lauri. Uh, just write it on the chat, and then we will have our great uh, communication team bringing to us the questions. But I would say first, let's start with you here in Berlin. Who wants to ask a question? Raise your hands. OK, there is one over there. Mike oh. doesn't work. Hello. Um, hey, uh, I, uh, thank you both for uh, excellent talks. Um, and uh, Laurie, I just want to say your your victory is such an uh, inspiration, and I mean your your uh, life's work also is. Uh, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I wanted to. Uh, I'm sorry, I have kind of a uh, non question, just a, a, a thing I wanted to share. Uh, watching this about um, the smart prefix, and I think it came first in my, uh, as far as I can see. The first object to be prefixed with smart was a smart bomb. And I think that might be a useful lens to look at smart tech through of like all of these smart objects are really things that are being um, enabled to be weaponized. Uh, is, um, I, I don't know if maybe there's stuff before the smart bomb that was smart. But anyway, thank you. But uh, is a do you want somebody to comment? Who? Just a comment. OK. Maybe I can answer to you something just uh, briefly, uh, I will tell uh, later, but uh, here at the Disruption Lab, our next project will be to launch a research institute to the effect of AI and weapon systems. So this is what we will start doing from September, and I have a little slide to show you at the end to launch this problem project, so I think it connects pretty well. Other question for our speakers? Here we have a lot of, okay, Cornelia wants to ask something. I noticed in the interview with uh, Ahmed Mansour that he made this distinction between the application of these technologies in democracies and authoritarian countries. But then I remembered what Tatiana said in the beginning about Julian Assange, the States. Uh, Manu said, you know, mentioned the role of the UK in this whole procedure, and I wonder, is there actually really a difference? One, two. <laughs> um, Ahmed was, um, is definitely uh, idealizing um, how things work in a democracy, and he, he refers to how it should be. So that happened a few times during the interview, um, that the assumption that, for example, the existence of an um, information act means that there's real transparency about information held upon me. So there were a few instances that's correct. Mm. Um, yeah, but basically he is aiming at, at the ideal situation. <laughs> yeah. I think it's important that we don't lose sight of that because obviously the world diverges from the ideal and sometimes it can seem like it's 
diverging faster and faster, but in, unless you maintain that image that, 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 that we have, you know, we have these ideals and that we should continuously aspire to, to re-question uh, how we can move it more in that direction. More questions? There is something from the internet, okay. So for Lauri, do you think that SUS valence could be automatized and will it be good or bad from your perspective? Yeah, so I mean, this is something that I, I wrote about um, last year. I was asked to write a chapter for the, the whistleblowing for change. And um, again, I sort of declined the opportunity to talk about myself. Instead, I wanted to provide a kind of positive vision uh, to, to balance out the um, um, uh, some some things that uh, uh, are less positive, and um, one of the one of the problems is uh, while whistleblowers are, are amazing, and we need to continue to strengthen protections for them, hopefully enshrining them in law, um, it requires uh, great courage and um, personal sacrifice, and we have seen how um, the the systems of of control that benefit from the, the lack of transparency um, will attempt to make the lives of those who, who have uh, acted boldly uh, difficult. Um, we saw it with uh, Ahmed Mansour, we see it with Julian Assange, with, with Aaron Swartz, with the, the difficulties that I faced. And so um, what I imagined uh, in that chapter was the the idea that the, this could be protocolized, um, that, that you could write into the, the very rules uh, of a society into the protocols that it would become transparent where required and um, it's it's a little bit of an involved topic but but there are these concepts in cryptography um, called zero knowledge and through zero knowledge uh, remarkable things can be done to to prove certain properties of a system as required but without then revealing any more information than is necessary for for that particular property to be proven and so uh, I was imagining ways in which um, behavior could still be, uh, conduct could still be engaged without having to be completely transparent at all times, but where necessary in retrospect when some conditions uh, have been met that suggest that there, there, may, there may have been some problematic functioning by, by some uh, people who, to whom power has been vested, um, then the system itself could become reactively uh, move from opacity to transparency and to um, to have this surveillance kind of built into the very functioning of the system. And it's something I could talk more offline with people about because it's still, it's still like, a, it's a dream, a dream and an aspiration, but I, I can see the way that the technology can enable this. Uh, so in between, while the audience is thinking about a question, also I have an additional question for Manu. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, since uh, we spoke about whistleblowing and also the idea of art to produce evidence, this is also a very important topic for us at the Disruption Network Club in our book that you mentioned, Whistleblowing for Change, which we publish a chapter also with uh, Laura Poitras, uh, Trevor Paglin, um, about uh, art as evidence uh, and uh, I think also what you do is pretty related to this concept uh, and I wanted to ask you um, uh, do you think uh, art is able to expose facts in a way that journalists uh, don't do and in which way this is possible according to do? To you. <laughs> um. So thinking about this question, I would consider all my artistic practice. I'm not um, uh, focused on creating documentary films. Um, I'm choosing the genre as it feels right for the question that I explore. Can be performative, installation, and yeah. <laughs> um, so it's more like the, the theme that's the, um, the, con the consistent um, maybe nature of, of my uh, work. And um, yeah, I feel like actually you put it quite precisely. It's this creative engagement that um, allows for the 
unexpected response. The story emerges, the findings emerge. Like you try to avoid to to put an expected an expected outcome at the end of it. Mm. But also, and I'm really wrestling with it in the case of this documentary. Mm. I find this creative engagement always rewarding when. Um, it uh, leads to this moment of imagining the, 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 the variations of reality and, and, and truth, and not variations of truth, but like um, uh, possible worlds, um, uh, rather than just exposing and criticizing. That's so, sort of the, the groundwork um, that then really helps to uh, fuel the imagination in, in, in those ways that you can imagine uh, how you would like to live. Mm. So I think mm, I personally was never asking myself uh, how to categorize my work. Like if I did activist things or artistic work, mm, I would always see it at one, as one and would always propagate to drop these categories. But I can see that there's a certain difference also in the financial and ethical framework, I guess, how um, you go about as a journalist or an artist. But even so, I feel with this um, new more recent approach that Bellingcat or, you know, this uh, forensic way of um, um, creating evidence blurs these borders, even these categories, even further. Mm. Yeah, totally agree. Mm. Um, okay, so again, I will pass it to the audience. Is there any question? One over there. Uh, thank you both very much for your uh, talks. I wanted to, uh, I've been thinking about the title of this talk and the inverted gaze, and um, I wanted to ask what the, um, what the inverted gaze should produce as a, you know, what kind of action should it generate? Should we just be looking at each other, <laughs> you know, in that kind of stare, or um, is there a desire to generate a particular response or behavior or... Um. I'd, I'd say it's to, it's to challenge the, that there should be a prevailing direction, that the, there should be the watchers and the watched, and that the, the, the watchers should necessarily be the ones that are further up in some py pyramidical structure of, of power, um, and that uh, rather by uh, saying that that can be inverted, that, that, that the power also, the, the the, sorry, the vigilance also works in the other direction. Um, an example that I always, always use, that always comes to mind because I had some experiences in court is that um, the court is this authority that decides things and in theory um, where, those, where that power is, is vested is, is in the, the judge, but actually the, the, the judge, it, it comes from the, the kingly, the princely court. Um, that there has to be this continuous organic relationship with the people that form, that sit in the gallery, that, that uh, are, are part, are, are in a participatory experience um, with the unfolding of that process. And so while that always remains uh, organic, while that also always remains uh, participatory, then it still has a chance to be alive. It still has a chance not to have a presupposed outcome. You want to add something, Manu? The same question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the encouragement, the invitation, actually an obligation to participation. Mm, I think that's the, the key. <laughs> Do we have still questions from the audience? Ah, there is again the online word. Let's listen.
So as people who are living in so-called democrat democratic countries, while they mainly all have relations, very good ones, with those authoritarian dictatorships around the world, like the ones mentioned by Manu, what do you think is the role of people from Europe and the global north to help play a role in changing all of this? Basically, I can retranslate. So she was saying that uh, uh, what is the role from uh, people from Europe and the global north also to change uh, uh, or help changing or contribute to change in this situation like the one you described and similar. Uh, so my answer would be to keep to hold our political representatives responsible, to demand um, accountability and transparency. So this is really what gets washed out, what we are on the verge to lose. And this is also where I see the danger that democracies resemble more and more <laughs> autocratic countries, but also it leaves us completely um, uh, it's, it's an, a meaningless question how to shape these relationships if we don't insist on um, these uh, democratic pillars um, where we are. And it's, it's not just um, forms of surveillance, like I mentioned earlier, just briefly. It's these new forms of disinformation and manipulation um, which will pose the challenge in the future. I, uh, I would say to that as well, it's, um, it's to, to be encouraged to not, to not be a bystander, that is to not, to, to not tacitly give consent um, by um, enjoying the state of affairs uncritically um, that results from these relationships with authoritarian regimes, these relationships of exploitation, um, and and um, and cruelty, and to to make our consent conditional on uh, on continuously challenging and holding to account and saying that that, that this should not happen uh, in my name. And, uh, yeah. This is also really the relationship um, that we have towards uh, the industry that needs to be questioned because it is the industry in uh, the global north that provides um, a lot of these platforms and services. So it's in our hands to really yeah, not accept this Faustian pact. It's not a given that we have to pay that price. Yeah, we should be able to negotiate it. And we are able, so let's do it. <laughs> Thank you, that is also why we are here. Um, I think we have time just for one last question, if there is. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can also conclude the panel, but uh, I want still to give the option if somebody wants to ask something. is a very special occasion to have here Manu and Lauri. Um, so, who wants still to ask something? We have something from the online? No. Okay, then uh, I would say that uh, what you say was pretty conclusive. And uh, I just want to mention briefly, um, before we officially end this panel, that we have uh, 45 minutes time to experience the great installations that we have here. So as we say, there is uh, Michelle and Lauri that will uh, guide you through their uh, installation Dazzle. And then I wanted to mention also the other artwork that we have here today. Uh, that uh, will be explained better tomorrow by Cornelia Solfrank. She will be in a keynote with the Yes Men. Um, it's called Tam Tam, the campaign that is related to the campaign Tam Tam Artists Inform Politicians that took place in Hamburg between 2005 and 2006. Um, and so this was uh, a protest that people did collectively against uh, the idea of creating this uh, new maritime museum in the, uh, that this was supposed to be uh, financed by the Hamburg city parliament uh, that offered to this controversial private collector, Peter Tam, 30 million euro and also an historic building in the harbor of Hamburg. And uh, 
art, many artists were really concerned about that because uh, this uh, Peter Tam was also a right-wing collector and they were afraid that this would, uh, uh, you know, not only celebrate his authoritarianism but also celebrate the fact that, uh, of course, uh, public money are given for you know, and use that is not appropriated, uh, not giving justice to what art uh, should do. So the whole initiative that was really great, and uh, you know, Cornelia will speak better about, <laughs> about this tomorrow, uh, was to partner up uh, artists with politicians, or at least try to inform them through action of artists, and the name of the artists are all listed on the wall. There is also a video about this initiative, and I found it very important when I spoke with Cornelia because it's really showing how you as an artist could also try to create a change, try to address politics, try to have a dialogue with politicians, try to make them understand if they are doing something that doesn't work and what should be done. And uh, so I find it a very nice and great initiative, and I ask Cornelia to put it back online, so now not in the whole website exists, but there is a great documentation that you can visit, so there is a QR code on the wall over there, so you can go a bit deeper, plus watch the video, and also enjoy this installation. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, Manu and Lauri, and uh, remind you that after this, we also have a great panel in which we will speak about uh, technology and bureaucracy of dominations uh, that are related uh, not only with art and technology, but also with the body. Uh, so please uh, don't go away. We are lucky that it's raining, so maybe you have nothing to do. <laughs> Stay here, enjoy the installation, and uh, thank you again, Manu and Lauri.